I don't know if you guys did your homework. So this is the first question. Because when setting up this particular session, uh, the Keystone asked me to supply them with two papers that could be sent to you guys in terms of reading material before you got here. And I sent you two papers, uh, one by uh, Sete in Rapoli and the other one by Nakaya in Pulundran. I could have sent you a whole bunch of, new, uh, of additional papers, okay? And primarily the first one there talks about the subject of reverse vaccinology and the second one about systems vaccinology. So if you've read about these, these two papers, that's gonna be the primary focus of discussion. And what I'd like to do is, but I'll also digress from that, is to go over those two papers with you so that you can understand a little bit more about these technologies. And again, apologies if you're already a convert and you're using these methods, but we just didn't know where to to pitch this particular presentation. I think we're really fortunate in that both Rapaoli as well as Palundran are speakers at the symposium, okay? So please make sure that you get to meet with them and talk with them um, and, and see where this goes. So for me, I think this is a really exciting time in the whole field of vaccine development, and it's for three key areas. One, and w these tools allow us to, to do three main things. The first, is to monitor immune responses to infection and immunization, okay? Not just infection, but immunization as well. The second, we have an incredible array now of methods for identifying candidate vaccine antigens. And the third is there's an increasing understanding now of how to improve the efficacy of vaccines, not in all cases, but certainly being able to redesign vaccine antigens to increase their efficacy. And in terms of the third one, it's not just the antigens themselves, it's also using different an antigen delivery systems, be they viral vectored vaccines or live attenuated bacterial pathogens, et cetera, and also adjuvants, okay? So these two papers, I think, play a key role in terms of these three methodologies. Now, if you read the, the reverse vaccinology approach, and it, it's quite startling because basically, in principle, you need to know zero immunology of the immune response to infection, which in itself is very threatening to immunologists. But on the other hand, the more immunology you do know about this, the more essential it becomes, particularly when you're moving away from proof of concept towards vaccine development work. And the systems vaccinology approach basically is trying to, to, to develop deeper molecular understanding of diseases. Uh, and the processes that protect against them and using that information to understand either what contributes to pathology as well as what contributes to immunity. And more importantly, perhaps addressing those in situations where vaccines don't work and ask the question, why do vaccines not work? And can we use that information to guide vaccine development in terms of success? So those are the two basic principles that I think are critical and are really setting new paradigms in vaccine development work and accelerating the rate of vaccine development as well. So the common feature of both of these is that they really, they rely on, on whole genome sequence data. They rely on high throughput methods and they're discovery driven. So they're discovery driven because you really don't know what you're gonna get in return but the further you get down that road, the more hypothesis driven it becomes. And so it's, it's a bit of a difficulty sometimes trying to explain to somebody, yeah, what are you gonna find if you say, I don't really know. But at the same time, I hope that you'll get convinced that these technologies are important to embrace and to take forward in the new era that we're talking about. Okay. So the technologies that have helped in this whole endeavor, the many, many of them, and I've only listed some of them over here, uh, clearly the leading ones are, are the new methodologies for, for sequencing DNA, RNA, and protein. There's a huge now progress in understanding uh, uh, carbohydrate structures through glycomics, metabolomics, immunology, bioinformatics, nanotechnology, structural biology, that's crystallography work, uh, computational biology, microbiomes, we'll come back to that, and if you have questions, I'll redirect them to Yasmin. Uh, the ability to make large DNA molecules, so we've all, all, always been able to make oligonucleotides, but you can now synthesize kilobase pairs of DNA. 
um, genome editing, um, and uh, a favorite thingy that I've got involved in recently is high-density peptide chips. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, as, as we go along. Okay, now as I said, the baseline data for all of this is whole genome sequence information, be they of the pathogens, the vector of disease. So for example, if you work on vector-borne diseases, be it mosquito, uh, tick, snail-borne, a variety of different types of uh, vectors, or their hosts, whether it's human, uh, mouse, uh, animals, whatever those might be. And very, these have all depended on cheaper computational power. You can now do things in your laptop that you needed a whole server to do on before. And we have amazing connection through the World Wide Web which allows us to really question, just ask questions of what have others found out about the whole area. And so you have Wikipedia-like information, okay? Um, that's great. You have a lot of data on model organisms, and the model organisms, by and large, tend to be mouse, yeast, bacteria, drosophila, uh, or C. elegans, if you are in the worm field as well. But there's a really rich information out there which you can basically look at and ask how does that impact the work that we're doing. But there's a very common problem in all of this as well. And very often we tend to believe computed data. So if you see something on the World Wide Web or if your computer program predicts something, you tend to believe it. My advice is don't. Don't believe it until you either experimentally verify it yourself, somebody else has done that, or it's a really well-defined model system in which that data has been um, already garnered, okay? I see this particularly in a lot of students who undertake bioinformatics courses. Uh, they come up with a variety of different fantastic new findings, but what you find is that it's basically an artifact of the system and because that's because it's statistics, okay? And as we all know, statistics are not 100% proof. You can manipulate that in any way that you like to get just the answer that you want as well. It's not that bad, okay? But on the other hand, you know, you know what it's like, okay? All right. So there's a big hype in the area of reverse vaccinology. And as new techniques, new technologies get developed, you know, it becomes fashionable to do that type of work. But what has been the success? Well, this is the success. I don't know if you know about this particular vaccine, but it's called Bexero. It's a first from a reverse vaccinology approach. I'm hoping that Reno will talk about this in his presentation. I don't know whether he will. But it's a vaccine that's been developed for meningococcal group B, which is dependent on priming an antibody response uh, that's surprisingly efficient. Now, if those of you who know about meningococcus group B in particular, it's been very difficult to develop a vaccine against this because most of the antibody response goes towards carbohydrates. And if you think about what's been done in the past, which for the sake of argument, let's call this the forward approach, is you take the immune responses, whether it's from your animal model or from humans who have experienced that infection, and you ask the question, what antigens do they identify? You work on the assumption that those play a role in vaccine um, development and you take that forward. Well, that didn't work in the case of meningococcal group B. The other thing is you find a few pathogens. You don't identify the whole range of pathogens. Um, if you looked at the genome sequence uh, of a bacterium, so who knows how many proteins does E. coli encode? How many? 4,000, great, okay, good enough, right? It's a lot. Um, so pathogens express a lot of proteins but you find very few in this particular instance. So the reverse vaccinology approach, and hopefully if you've done your homework, you'll recognize that figure. Yep, X, I, hear, I heard several yeses, excellent. Okay, so that figure basically talks about what they did, okay? Developed, used the genome sequence of the pathogen that, can, that uh, causes the disease, took a bioinformatics approach to identifying candidate antigens, used high throughput methods, I think they started with about expressing about 600 genes, immunized um, mice, made antibodies in mice to those antigens, asked the question, did those antibodies play a role in um, killing the bacteria? 
Um, that reduced the number down to about 90. I can't remember the exact number. And then they homed in on about four or five. And four or five are the ones that have gone forward in terms of making uh, the vaccine that they've come up with. And what you can see there is that there's kind of a spiraling um, progression in terms of coming to the candidate ant antigens there. And the advantage is that you can screen all pathogen molecules. Is that a true statement? Yes? No? I have some yeses, I have some noes. Who said no? Okay, well, the noes win, although we didn't have very many of them. And the reason that the noes win is because this approach only allows you to look at protein antigens, depending on where you express your proteins. In this case, the expression work was done in E. coli, but E. coli doesn't post-translationally modify the antigens. And so you miss out, well, at least these particular ones, I should say. Um, so you miss out on all the bacterial-specific, uh, meningococcal, actually, bacterial-specific carbohydrates, okay? So while it's very good, it does have its limitations. This has now been used in a whole variety of novel uh, bacterial infections, and hopefully Lirino will talk about those. So in addition to the antibody work, the paper also talked about T-cell work. And here I've pulled out some work that we've been involved with at ILRI, which is developing a pipeline for identification of antigens that are recognized by CD8 T cells. So you remember, Yasmin talked about CD4 and CD8 T cells. We are particularly interested in CD8 T cells because they play a role in, in, uh, in immunity against a disease called East Coast fever. And you'll hear a lot more about this particular disease on Tuesday. Um, so we developed this particular pipeline for uh, identifying uh, these antigens, again, starting off with whole genome sequence information, prediction of candidate antigens, cloning these, and then going into a cell-mediated assay. So this is an ELISPOT assay as opposed to an antibody assay, okay? But that, again, allowed us to identify candidate antigens and then making synthetic peptides uh, because, as you well know, T cells see peptides rather than whole antigen uh, in the context of either class one or class two molecules. This is in the context of class one molecules and whether, wherever there's a peak here, this corresponds to an epitope. So you'll hear a lot more from, from a talk from Ivan Morrison uh, in this particular area and we have a couple of uh, posters as well on this. But what the paper was talking about was, can you use, re use reverse immunology to simplify uh, the identification of CD8 T cells? And the answer is yes, because this shows you a 3D reconstruction of the peptide in complex with MHC, and each MHC will bind a range of peptides that exhibit a motif. So as soon as a peptide identify a motif, you can develop algorithms, and you can then try to predict them in a computational manner. And so we've been working with a particular program called NetMHC PAN, and we've been developing a whole bunch of new types of immunological assays that Yasmin was talking about, which are the tetramers, uh, because they didn't exist for the bovine, okay? Part of the problem about working on the livestock side is that we have to develop our own reagents. Nobody does them for you. And so we have a community that kind of works together, but you can't go to a company and buy these reagents. So this really affects the ability and the livestock side to be able to develop vaccines, but nevertheless, we're trying to catch up uh, with the human and mouse community. So this just shows you generation of peptide tetramers that allows us to do peptide binding assays and to also screen libraries. Um, and this just shows you one example of where the algorithm was saying that the sequence we were working with was wrong. Although it worked in the ELISPOT data, it didn't work in the peptide binding assay and the algorithm predicted, predicted that we needed to be working with a shorter peptide and that shorter peptide bound to the MHC. And that also now is reflected when we stain CD8 T cells with tetramers that we can make. You can see that the shorter peptide here works whereas the longer one doesn't. So algorithms do have value. They, they can guide the research that you're doing, uh, but you have to experimentally verify them, okay? 
The last slide that I want to show in terms of, of antigen discovery, and again, thank you, Brian, for introducing the topic, is, on, is in the area of contagious bovine pleuropneumonia. So um, genetics is extremely powerful. If you can genetically modify anything, you can learn a lot in, rever in return. Well, the bacterium that causes CBPP, or contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, there is no genetics for it. Um, but some of my previous colleagues have been working up um, synthetic genomics approaches towards synthesizing whole bacterial genomes. And they started with mycoplasma because it has the smallest known genome size. So you can resynthesize a bacterial genome. And what's quite, quite remarkable is that if you put a yeast origin of replication in that genome, you can actually maintain that in yeast. So if you do that, you can now use yeast genetics to manipulate the bacterial genome. You can recover the mutated bacterial genome, transplant it into a recipient cell, use a selection mechanism that kicks out the resident bacterial genome, and the incoming genome now reprograms that cell, and you reconstitute your mutant. So it's really, it's kind of mind-blowing stuff when you think about it earlier, but this is now becoming routine, okay? So you can keep your bacterial mutants in yeast. You can reconstitute your bacteria when you want to by transforming those bacterial genomes back into yeast, uh, into the bacterial cell. Unfortunately, this has only been worked out so far for mycoplasma. Uh, eventually, obviously, it would be great if you could do it with other bacterial cells as well. So what we've done here, and this is work that's been done by Jörg Joris, one of my colleagues, uh, we've knocked out a gene here that codes for the carbohydrate uh, envelope of the mycobacterium, and basically what we've shown in this assay here is that when you knock out uh, that, the, the carbohydrate structure, these cells become a lot more leaky, as you can see by this diffuse staining over here. And when we put this mutant into, this is actually doing this with the goat variant of mycoplasma, when we put this into goat, the strain is now apathogenic. So we haven't done the testing to see whether this might work as a vaccine, but that clearly would be the next step that we're doing. Now, I would highly rec I didn't send you the paper on this particular work, but Sanjay Vashi, who's from the Craig Venter Institute, is gonna be giving a talk on this subject. So again, I recommend you that you go and listen to this. Not only is he now talking about making synthetic bacterial genomes, but they're now also making synthetic viral genomes. So you can now mac uh, um, mix and match uh, viral genomes as well in terms of their use uh, in, in viral vectored vaccines. And in particular, they've been working with pox viruses uh, and, and um, CMV. Okay, so let's switch approaches now to the systems vaccinology. And again, this is a figure taken out of the paper. So if you've read the paper, this paper will be familiar to you, uh, this figure rather. And basically, it starts off by, by considering humans that you're vaccinating here. You're doing something to a human population. And then using high-resolution max spectrometry to see what happens to individuals here. So site off. So the replacement that's now happening for the, for the tetramer staining, the facts sorted uh, uh, that, that uh, Yasmin was showing earlier and I talked about. And there's actually going to be a paper that's going to be talking about this. So again, hopefully you'll get familiar with what's going on here. Um, metabolomics, so what happens to metabolites in these humans? The proteomics, so what happens to the protein population in here? High throughput sequencing, um, RNA-seq, expression linked uh, to the RNA-seq, and then getting down to the single cell level. At the moment, things are concentrating either at the tissue or the cell population level. But what are the individual cells that are contributing that population doing? Going back to the argument, like you've got so many different types of memory cells. Are they all doing the same job? Are they doing something different? Can we identify what that is at the level of the single cell and then integrate that all back together? At the microbiome level, why should microbiomes be of interest? Anybody? You're going to hear all about it in Yasmin's talk, but just... Uh, <laughs> Nobody? Okay, so if you think about the number of microbes that live in us as an individual, apparently we're outnumbered 10 to 1. Okay, 
So are you human or are you a microbe? <laughs> Good question, right? But a lot of them are going to be alive and our immune system has to learn to live with them and vice versa, okay? So it's inevitable if you think about it that the microbial composition that we have are going to influence us both in health as well as in disease. And there's a newer appreciation for that and new technologies that now allow us to look at those things. And they actually do also influence vaccine take, uh, the efficacy of vaccines and, and pre-immunization and things like that, which will all be revealed to you by Yasmin, okay? So all of these then get integrated into databases. You need clever people with computer algorithms to basically do data modeling, integrate all of that, and then come up with biomarkers, either of protection or immunogenicity. And this is uh, a figure taken out of one of the earlier papers from Bali's lab, where basically the idea is to try and ask if you looked at vaccine X, Y, Z, or W, this could be vaccines to different pathogens. What is common between them? What is different between them? Can you start developing signatures either in terms of the B cells or the T cells, break that down into various different ways or the inert signatures as well, okay? And hopefully this then becomes a marker of whether somebody is either going to be immune or they're gonna become, or they're more susceptible to disease. And again, there are gonna be a few talks on this subject as well, okay? I think both in the context of TB, uh, malaria, and maybe HIV as well, I, I, I can't quite remember. So again, please go for these things. So let's drill down a little bit onto the B cells and T cells, okay? Um, oh, the other thing is that what this does now, not only is it looking at the population level, but it's also looking at individual levels, okay? So we're going away from this concept of one size fits all. So like if you have a headache, just take Panadol, okay? Move away from that. You know, the cause of your headache might be different or paracetamol if you're from the US. But, but the idea is to get away from this business about there's just one answer to our problems. Okay, so B cells make antibodies, T cells target intracellular pathogens. And the beauty about this now is that we know that the specificity of these are dependent on the B cell receptor genes, the B cell receptors, and T cell receptors, so we can sequence those. So you could make a database of these receptor gene sequences, you can identify sequence to the function and identify correlates of immunity, and these also can become diagnostic assays. So for example, if you look at the cancer field now, um, the T cell receptor repertoire is being used as diagnostic markers of whether people are succeeding in terms of cancer therapies because what you get in some situations is you get an overwhelming representation of one type of clonal response, both in the B cell side or T cells, and you can follow those diagnostically post-treatment. And so this is now being used in clinical studies in terms of what's happening uh, in humans. But we're going down this road as well. Uh, as I said, people have been looking at the, at the population level, but the sequencing at the single cell level becomes important as well. And there are various laboratories as well as uh, companies now that are beginning to offer this as a service. So even if you don't do it yourself, you can contract this out, okay? And you're the, if you're working either at the clinic or in the lab, you're the person with the interesting samples, okay? And this is now becoming a commodity. So you can send this, some, this stuff away and get sequence in return. And there's this company called a Trekker that's developed uh, sequencing both of antibody pairs and TCR, T cell receptor genes from humans uh, and mice. And this allows you at the other end of it to do all the interesting work. But the idea here is that you can do clustering analysis to ask what are the major responses as shown here by green? What are the minor responses as shown here by blue? And then ask, put function to these sequences. And so we're working with them now not developing all of these, but at least for the bovine, uh, developing the single cell work. We've had a few technical hitches here, and, and the reason is, is not technical, it's security related. Um, we work in Africa, we have foot and mouth disease in Africa, and so we can't send samples to the US, which is where this work is being done. And so we're trying to find all sorts of shortcuts to that. But this basically 
is the way that things are going. Once you have sequence data, you can make recombinant antibodies and ask the question, what is their function? So to go back to this particular figure here, so you basically have your biomarkers and protection or immunogenicity. You can now start to test or validate that either back in your human population or in your animals as well. Now, if you're fortunate in having a mouse model, you're fantastic because you have incredible resources that are available to you uh, because you can manipulate the, the mouse genome in a variety of different ways. There are knock-ins, knock-outs. You can do uh, interference RNA experiments. And this business of genome editing, which is really taking off, um, I think um, I wouldn't be surprised if these guys get a Nobel Prize, but let's see, you never know what the Nobel Foundation offers prizes to. Uh, sometimes they come up with the most amazing thing that you wouldn't have predicted. But anyway, so genome editing is, is really the big thing now because it allows you to do site-specific manipulation and not just at one site, but multiple sites uh, in an individual organism, uh, be it in, in protozoa, uh, or in mammals as well. And so this is becoming a really big deal in terms of being able to manipulate genomes. And then that can go back and see how that relates back to the vaccination side of things, okay? So this is really, I think, what the, syst what the systems vaccinology is doing is it's, it's forcing us to think away from the very narrow s view that we used to have in the area of vaccinology and looking at it holistically, okay? So that is the key thing. It's also extremely multidisciplinary, as you can see. You need to have loads and loads and loads of different types of expertise that comes together in terms of undertaking these, these types of approaches. Um, a lot of engineering has gone into developing the methods uh, that are used as well. Uh, particularly if on the site of side of things, because that's integrating mass spec in with the phenotyping of, of, of the side of things, uh, the computational side as well. And so one thing that I would really encourage you to think about is if you are not engaged in this type of research is to think about during this three days here is making the contacts with people to be able to try and build up the networks to explore these types of approaches because you really don't know where it's going to lead you. And I think that's the key thing, right? If you don't have a hypothesis or you don't know what the next step is, you don't know what's going on, very often these types of approaches will allow you to determine what the next steps should be. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up um, and we're gonna finish fairly early. So come back to this business about vaccines in the genomics era. It's multidisciplinary, it's large data-driven, okay? There's nothing wrong with the conventional approaches. They've worked fine and they still work, they still do work, and there's a lot to be said for empirical approaches, okay? But empirical approaches, if they fail, don't teach you anything. Now, if you take empirical approaches and you can learn from them, fantastic. Um, and you can integrate all sorts of other things when you take an empirical approach as well to understand why it doesn't work. But what we're saying here is that the genomics approaches is, is an additional way of trying to tackle these problems as well and that there is an overlap between them. Neither of them are really exclusive. I think that's the key thing. Um, however, there's a lot more effort that's going on at the moment, particularly for the difficult problems because we after many years of research, I mean, you were pointing out to HIV, um, you know, how come we don't have a vaccine for HIV 30 years down the road, or for malaria, or for the other diseases? And these new technologies are giving us hope that this is a problem that we will be able to tackle. So they both identify antigens and delivery systems that I think can be taken forward. And what we've done here is to go, as, at least in what I've discussed, is getting as far as proof of concept, um, be it in the animals or the vaccinators themselves, right? Doesn't matter which disease you're looking at, we're talking about both human and veterinary vaccines uh, in this particular symposium. But there is a key thing that's still left, which is what Brian was referring to, and it really is key, okay? We're talking about discovery-driven early phase research, 
but commercialization of a particular product is extremely important. And it's probably even more complex because it goes into the hands of people who've got nothing to do with the science. Um, and often that is a problem as well because you have to answer to a lot of regulatory issues, a, log, a lot of what if issues. And I don't know whether Reno will talk about this, but I remember a couple of years ago when they were talking about the Bexero vaccine. So I, I was fortunate in the sense of having uh, working at the, at the Tigers, uh, Tiger Institute when this, this whole thing was, was breaking. And they got to the stage of identifying the antigens that needed to go into the vaccine about 16 years ago. It took them another 10 years just to go through the regulatory hoops before they could get the product out onto the market, okay? So the early phase is, is critical, but you have to pay equal attention to what after proof of concept, and that's a different ballgame. And that's what Brian was referring to. It's much easier on the veterinary side because you develop all your data in the animal of interest. You're not applying things that you learn from a mouse model into humans or from monkey models into humans, and it's a different ball game. But the whole point of this um, meeting as well as this con the, the symposium is to stimulate um, the African continent in terms of being able to take discovery-driven research. Uh, as a continent, there's been a lot of research that's been done on the clinical side of things, but I think if you look at what are the products that have come out from Africa, developed in Africa, that have gone into clinical trials, it's not that many. And what we're trying to do with this symposium is to stimulate you guys as science scientists, developing country scientists working here to develop these programs yourself and to build up that whole base of vaccine-related research so that we can then take it from discovery to development and commercialization as well. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. So I'm going to regulate my own meeting unless somebody else wants to. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, first, second. Oh, please come up to the microphone. Yeah, I have to get my thoughts in order, but basically what I was wondering about is uh, when you do a lot of the animal vaccine testing, you have your animals housed and fed the same diet. Although they're not inbred like the mice are, they're outbred, but they still would have much the same microbiomes, all of them. Now, when you look at a human population, somebody likes his burgers and french fries, someone else is gonna have a vegan, feta minus uh, Greek salad. So you're never gonna have uh, convergence of the microbiome in the same way that you would have in any animal uh, population. So when uh, you develop correlates of protection uh, and you're looking at a vaccine like a pox vaccine which just worked in just about every vaccinated person uh, and other vaccines that only work in 90% of the individuals. How much of the variation can you attribute to genetic heterogeneity of the human genome as opposed to the microbiome's genetic heterogeneity? That's basically what I was trying to. Okay, so I, I mean that's a very complex question. Okay, on 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 the on the livestock side at least, there are very good examples of animals and animal breeds that are genetically resistant or genetically tolerant to some pathogens, okay? Be it on the livestock, domesticated livestock side or on the wildlife side, right? And let, let me give you an example. For ex uh, in West Africa, there's a breed of cattle that's uh, tolerant to, to sleeping sickness, African sleeping sickness whereas the cattle in East Africa are, are susceptible. Um, there are some old world monkeys which are genetically resistant to sleeping sickness as well, 
whereas humans are susceptible to one particular subtype of trypanosome infections. So it works out that in the, in the monkeys, well, so first of all, as ilri has been working on what is the molecular basis of difference between the tolerant and susceptible animals uh, to, 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 to trypanosome infections. And it turns out to be a polygenic trait. There are about uh, eight to nine markers that are associated in, in, in that. Um, and the question is, prior to genome editing, what would you do about that, right? Because to develop a genetic program to try and identify the, comp the, the influence of each of those sites would be very difficult. But let's jump to the old world monkey situation. It turns out that there are two genes that are responsible for resistance to trypanosome infections. We have a variant of that particular gene that gives us immunity to one trip trypanosome species, but not the others. If you take those genes and you transfect them into mice, mice which are sensitive become totally resistant to trypanosome infections, right? So this is gonna be continuing on Brian's um, uh, plea for GMO vaccines. We have a plea for GMO animals as well, because you could wipe out trypanosome's uh, susceptibility in African cattle if you made transgenic animals. We know how to do it. Okay? The question is, would you be allowed to do it? And the question goes beyond that as well. So very often we have the technology, right? The solution is going to be dependent on the regulators or not. But we should influence that as well, and we should play a role in that. Coming back to your microbiome question, I thought it was going to be totally different. But Yasmin, do you want to try and approach that one? Or we do it later? Yeah? So let me... So I, I think this is actually really an outstanding question. I mean, there is, has been a few studies on linking the microbiome to vaccine responses, essentially experimentally at the moment. In malaria, for example, experimental vaccine, if you change the gut microbiota, you change the quality of the, of the immunity. If you remove the microbes using antibiotics, you shut down mucosal immunity in the context of vaccines. So your question is very pertinent to the diversity of responses. One setting it where it has been revealed is cancer immunotherapy. If you change the microbe in the gut microbiota, the quality of immune responses in the context of cancer immunotherapy is completely different. So I think this is really an outstanding question and something that may be fascinating to explore, maybe actually more in the veterinarian world actually than in human because it may be more easy to control for different kind of microbiota or diet. And I hope over the next few years that will happen. Yeah. So, I mean, the point is that some of it will be genetically driven, as you pointed out, just because of the difference in individual genetics. Uh, but the other one are going to be these epigenetic phenomena, and then how do you control them? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thank you. I, I have just a question uh, related to your last statement, saying that now African scientists need really to engage in uh, discovery-driven research. <laughs> And my question is that we know that in Africa, one of the, I mean, one of the big limits we have is equipment and fund to do really basic, sophisticated research. And I have seen what you have done in Kenya, which is very, very impressive. Uh, I know that many people have proposed many solutions. What is your thought for, you, uh, for us African to develop? What, 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 what can you share with us in terms of, of developing this basic research? That's always a catch-22 situation, isn't it? Because um, unfortunately, the newer technologies are heavy on, on instruments. They're, they're expensive. Um, in terms of what Africa can do, I don't want this to be a political statement, and this needs to be, this needs to be edited out of, out of the, the, the Keystone Symposium video that's taking place at the moment, okay? Uh, but, but I think one thing is that the African governments need to reinvest and invest more in the science and technology in their countries. Uh, I think the African Union needs to play a bigger role in that as well. Uh, and I think the African Development Bank as well can play a leading role in terms of the investments that are needed. And they are actually going that way. The African Development Bank has a huge program that's coming online. You've got the NEPAD partnerships, the new partnerships for Africa development, 
Uh, you've got the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, foundations that are, are providing a lot of the seed money that's going into, uh, into these types of venues. We also have a program at, at ILRI that some of you may be familiar with called BECA, the Biosciences Eastern African Central Africa, the lab, uh, where there's a lot of capacity building, teaching, training that's being done. And also people who don't have access to high-tech equipment can come to ILRI to do their own research as well. Unfortunately, it concentrates on Eastern Central Africa, but there are efforts to try and, and, and get similar types of institutions set up in other parts of Africa. Um, there is no one simple solution. Uh, in the interim, I would suggest that you, we use this venue to try and network and work together in terms of at least implementing those activities in your programs. There's one more here and one. So we're running out of time, so two more questions, okay? One and then two. Well, my name is Samuel Karioki from Kenya. I never, I, I never read the papers. I don't know you guys, <laughs> you read the papers because it was not sent to me. So, but I want to hear this one from you. Does this uh, reverse and, um, reverse and uh, systems vaccinology apply to all kind of patho pathogens? like bacterial, viral, or eukaryotic pathogens? Yes, simple answer. But it can also be used for non-infectious diseases. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's not just limited to infectious disease research. You could use, you can use it, particularly the systems approach, you could use it for any um, medical or veterinary condition as well. Okay, thank uh -huh. you. Okay. Um, I want to find out how easy or difficult it is to use um, reverse genetics for infectious diseases that have multi-stages, like plasmodium, for example. And apart from the fact that they have multiple stages, um, they have different sites that they would like to reside in at different stages, compared to other infectious diseases like bacteria that have a particular localized site. So if one is using reverse genetics, how easy is it? Or are there leads that one can follow in order to you know, get a target that may be immunogenic? Sure, that's a great question. Let me come back to that second point. But before that, don't think of bacteria as all making the same complement of proteins. They don't. What you see in vitro is very different from what you see in vivo, and they will make different proteins based on which organ they're in or different tissues they're in, because they're going to be reacting to their environment just as multi-stage pathogens would as well. Okay, so that's number one. So to, to go back to your question, I mean, I think that's a great question. So um, I think in toxoplasma, I mean, let me, let me deal with the pathogens that I know the most, which, which is primarily on malaria and, and, and toxo. The extremely well genetic systems that have been developed, particularly in toxo, and doing that now in, in toxoplasma and doing it now with, with plasmodium as well. Um, if you, it, it's a critical question that becomes particularly relevant when you're studying the different life cycle stages. You know, what causes for example, a sporozoid, I, I presume you work on protozoa, right? So what causes the different life cycle stages? What are the stimuli that causes them to differentiate from one stage to the next? Um, and that's now be beginning to get worked out, particularly in the rodent malarias, uh, where there are very nice models that allow you to do that, and then to do the site-specific um, uh, knockouts or knock-ins that then control the different levels of differentiation. So there'll be a great talk that's been given um, in the malaria section by, by Shahid Khan, uh, basically looking at that particular uh, situation is how do you take those, the, the complexity apart, not just from a pathogen perspective, but then also from the stage specificity aspect of it as well. And you have stage specificity not just in the mammalian host, but also in the vector as well. It's equally complex in the vector as well, which we often don't think about, but, but can be just as important. Okay, um, so 
I think it's been a great session. Uh, I hope that you've uh, benefited from this afternoon session. Um, I really want to thank Yasmin and, and Brian again for agreeing to speak. And uh, we're here for the next three days, so please look us up, look us out, and challenge us with your questions. Um, don't be frightened and don't be shy on the questions that you ask, no matter how naive you think they might be. Um, I can tell you you've already asked three, which kind of got us scratching our heads. So just keep that going as well. Uh, but the, the reception, I think, starts at six, is it? I'm not quite sure what it is. Six? Okay. So we're, we're a few minutes early, but it allows us some time to, to still continue talking. But thank you again very much, and see you upstairs.